I think that just as we're living in a nuclear age, we have grown so tremendously in scientific knowledge, it doesn't seem uh, too much to say that men can begin to awaken to the fact that they have, haven't grown enough spiritually and haven't recognized their spiritual capacities. Once something like eating is death, then you've struck at the very heart of life. The enemy of the older radical theories may have been the ruling class, but today the stakes of whether we will reform ourselves into a new kind of human being, a new kind of society, whether we will find selves worth being, the stakes of it are simply life itself. Modernity has created promises that it has no ability to keep. What this means is that we're a society of disembedded individuals, um, stuck in the impossible situation of being alone together. And what was understood as emancipation has proved to be a form of isolation. It is important to understand that what I am telling you is not simply a cultural history. It's a description of the story that shapes every single person that you know. This is why there is a rise in mental illness. It's absolutely concurrent with the disembedding of the individual because individuals can't constitute themselves by the very nature of the case. Subjectivity cannot sustain its own weight. We need others to tell us. But we've been given an ethical mandate by the Enlightenment that tells us that that's immoral, that nobody should constrain us. Well, some of you may remember Alex Christoyanopoulos um, from appearance he made on my Christian Anarchism seminar and want to welcome you back, Alex. Uh, Alex is a reader in politics and international relations at Loughborough University. And uh, he's here with us today to talk about an article that he wrote about Dorothy Day from a couple of years ago um, that really, I thought, was, was one of the best things I've read about Day and sort of like the formulation of her ideas over time, particularly related to the influence of Tolstoy. Um, so Spencer and I both appreciated that article a lot. And we just wanted to talk to you about it because we are inspired by the Catholic worker movement. Um, and I don't know if you know, in the meantime, since you uh, did that other class, Spencer and Emily, Emily and Spencer are now engaged. They are running the JP2 Catholic Worker Farm now here in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, so they're a part of the movement. Um, cool. So welcome, Alex. Is there anything else that you would like to say about yourself before we get started? No, not particularly. First, thanks for inviting me. Delighted to be uh, back in conversation with you. The, the one thing I will say is uh, to stress that the article is, of course, co-authored with Eric Nelson. And I'm going to be completely honest. Originally, it was Eric's I think it was a master's dissertation that was on this. Then he, you know, he got in touch as he was writing it. He got in touch when it was done. And from then on, we worked on it together um, to get it published, you know, to transform it from a, a master's dissertation. It was much longer. It did all sorts of other things. Uh, we reconfigured it into, into what became this, this particular article. But, uh, I, you know, um, I need to recognize his co-authorship. Uh, so that's done. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I should have said that. Um, so, you know, we are just really interested in how the Catholic worker movement, you know, where it derived its inspiration from, um, you know, how it got started, and now its trajectory. Um, and so, I mean, tell us a little bit about like, why you guys decided to write this article, like what inspired you to write it in the first place? That's where I don't mean, I hope I won't do that too often, but it would be more interesting to speak to Eric in the sense that it was his spur that got him going in the in, in the first place. He clearly was interested in the Catholic worker and in Tolstoy and wanted to see how much of a lineage, if that's too strong a word, I don't know, you could trace from Tolstoy to the Catholic worker because as you will know, um, as, as as we also argue in there, it, it, that lineage isn't particularly clear. Dorothy Day clearly hints at Tolstoy having been an influence in her life, but she rarely references his religious and political writings. She mentions more the fiction. And so, and yet, a Catholic worker movement is 
one of the central examples mentioned in the literature, not just by me, uh, of Christian anarchism in action, as it were, these days, today. Um, and, and Tolstoy is, of course, one of the main names mentioned uh, behind Christian anarchism, even if he's an awkward client. And so it was, it was always going to be interesting to sort of try and trace exactly what lineage there might be or what inspiration I prefer perhaps to, to lineage. And so that's, I think, what, what drove him to sort of pick this up and what made me interested in, in, this, in, in, in this angle as well and, and unpicking that in, in, in closer detail. So would it be fair to say you brought like the Tolstoy emphasis to the article? Because haven't you written a ton about him? I have written a fair bit about him, yes, um, and, and much more on him than the Catholic worker. Yes, I think that would be one aspect. The other is Eric did this for his MA dissertation, has, has moved away from that now, doesn't work in the academy anymore. So I, I guess I, how shall I put it, I, I brought the kind of scaffolding and the the, the, well, the vocabulary, the grammar of, kind of uh, peer-reviewed writing i suppose to some extent too but yeah absolutely i could i could speak to the tolstoy bit in particular what eric did more than i did is he did the archival work because this is based on him digging up a couple of archives to sort of look at the um the exchanges of letters in particular between Eamon hennessy and um dorothy day and that bit he did but of course yes i i brought the the tolstoy expertise if you will and if it's not too off topic, like how do you feel about Tolstoy and his impact on your life uh, or lack thereof? How do I feel about Tolstoy and his impact on my life? <sighs> Tolstoy is an interesting client. We might get to talk about this in greater detail a bit later on. He's someone who is awkward in his Christianity, in his anarchism, in his pacifism, in everything that he is said to stand for. He sits awkwardly for many others. So it, it means that few people acknowledge him as an influence, for example. He clearly influenced my life in the sense that, you know, the PhD was originally going to be just about him. Then it became about Christian anarchism more generally. And I, and I kind of went back to him afterwards to eventually write the kind of book length study that, uh, that became the book, as well as the various other articles I've written. He's, he's someone who, uh, whose eloquence when it comes to denouncing violence continues to move me, I think. But he's also someone from whom I've taken some distance over time uh, because he's just too much of an absolutist on the number of areas. So, uh, yeah, th that said, I'll be forthright. You know, if, if my... Uh, prefer or the angle I would probably identify with most as a Christian anarchist, as it were, would be more of a Tolstoyan than an Elulian or any other. And that kind of says probably already more than I have said in writing about where I stand on anti-clericalism, anarchism more generally, and, and Tolstoy's views. I'm not a Tolstoyan through and through by any measure, but I have a lot of sympathies for quite a lot of his arguments, if, even if I don't follow him as far as he goes. So, Yes, I mean, that. Yeah, I could go on, but that really gives you enough. Okay, but so what does it mean to be a Tolstoyan? Uh, uh, and, you know, like what, for people who don't know, like what was his take on Christianity and what it means to be a Christian? Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, the, the, the caveat is, of course, that what it means to be anything according to a particular name can be interpreted differently by different people, even the same person at different times in their lifetime. So it, it, it's obviously... Um, a question that runs, runs away from you. Tolstoy is, of course, the same Tolstoy who authored War and Peace and Anna Karenina, one of the most famous novelists of all time, one of the celebrated ones. Um, he, however, for uh, when he was in his 50s, as he was writing Anna Karenina, was he in his 50s, 40s, 50s, went through an existential crisis, which he then wrote about after the event as, as something that really... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, yeah, made him particularly anxious and existentially sort of insecure, worried about the meaning of life given that death was to follow and something which he describes as having been resolved uh, 
as a kind of coin drop moment when he reread, he had read it before, but one more time, uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And upon reading that, and in particular the injunction to not resist evil, but to turn the other cheek, that suddenly, he says, he realized was meant exactly as it was meant and not as many layers of interpretation have reinterpreted it to mean. And, and from there, he takes a complete condemnation of violence. He's a rare, absolute pacifist. A lot of pacifists or a lot of pacifism gets dismissed because it's assumed to be an absolutist position. Very few pacifists are absolute in their pacifism in the sense that they would go all the way to not necessarily protecting the children when attacked, it also was ambivalent on this. Um, but he he goes all the way. And on the basis of that pacifism, which he lands on through his reading of Jesus, develops his anarchism because he's going to reject all violence, whether it is um, for any reason whatsoever, including kind of revolutionary violence by revolutionaries from the bottom up. So he's going to be critical of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, or at least up until, you know, when he dies in 1910, soon before the Russian Revolution. But he's also critical of the violence of the state, the top-down violence of, of the army, of the Tsar, and, and, and the uh, unequal distribution of land and wealth, which is protected by violence, etc. So that's his anarchism, which he gets to through his pacifism. Um, but also because of that, he's going to become very strongly anti-clerical. He's going to be very critical of the Russian Orthodox Church because as far as he's concerned, it has betrayed the teaching of Jesus, which is this kind of ethical core as summarized in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so he's going to be very critical of church dogma, church traditions, church rituals, and he's going to be quite acerbic about that because of his commitment to pacifism, because he thinks it has betrayed Jesus's teachings. Um, and it's on the basis of this kind of rejection of violence that he's going to advocate as a solution, as it were, but that's his very kind of monolithic solution, basically desisting from all violence. If you want no violence in the world, take no part in it. So take no part in it as someone who wants to change the system, take no part in it if you're called to be a member of a jury or uh, for military conscription or to work for the police or the state. You want no violence, take no part in it. But all that flows from his pacifism, which is if not rooted in, at least clearly inspired by uh, his reading of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. The reverse, his vegetarianism as well, he derives from that, but it, it's it's this kind of absolute non-violence or pacifism um, which defines then the last 30 years of his life. And for the last 30 years of his life, he's going to write much less when it comes to fiction. He will write a bit, but, but much more uh, political and religious and other commentaries, short and long, depending on circumstance, basically articulating this position for a variety of different audiences, domestic and international uh, for that matter. That's the Tolstoy I'm particularly interested in, the Tolstoy who lands on that territory, even if there are all sorts of signs earlier in his writings that he's probably going to go in that direction. I mean, you can find, I think you could say you could find latter Tolstoy prefigured in the earlier Tolstoy, and he himself perhaps overdoes the break for almost theatrical effect uh, on, to describe himself as a new man. Um, but yeah, that that that's... Now, what's Tolstoyan... Um, gets tricky because there are at the time and for for a, for a two three years it, it's quite it spreads there's a sort of international tolstoyan movement people who read him and think oh yeah let's let let's do that let's try and and not resist um violently by any measure not take part in violence and some go off into communes and set up communities many of which kind of flounder and at the mo for a period that there, there, there is Kind of a sense of Tolstoyanism. There are Tolstoyans. Um, many of these flounder and dissipate. And, and since then, there have been people who would describe themselves as Tolstoyan. I've still, you know, met and encountered some today. Am I a Tolstoyan? I don't know. I'm someone who's interested in Tolstoy, who writes about him, who I guess indirectly advocates some of his views, who's very sympathetic to a lot of what he says. Does that make me a Tolstoyan? You decide. Uh, but yeah, that, that'd be the, the end of the long version of the answer. Fair enough. And then we're, we're specifically interested in this because like uh, I have a thesis that Laurie's kind of come around to that the Catholic worker movement is split between like the the right wing if you will is are like more in 
devotees that want like uh, a Christian reconstruction of the social order. Um, and they tend more towards the communes, the agrarian communes, the agronomic universities. And then there's like a, a bigger, the left wing, if you will, the Hennessy wing, where uh, there's a tendency to be Tol so Tolstoyan um, or, or Radlib or whatever it is that uh, I wonder why they're even Catholic workers. Um, why not just identify as a Tolstoyan? But I guess, like, how would you react to that thesis? And and do you think your article, at least to some degree, supports it? I think it's an interesting thesis. It's certainly worth exploring. Dorothy Day was conflicted herself in a number of ways. And, and I guess that what the what we do in the article is, is trace her trajectory through her life, how she, in many ways, that's what you read when you read his autobio her autobiography, was kind of conflicted between, on the one hand, a commitment or a commitment that she wants to have to, yeah, the church, but certainly its theology as well, um, you know, yeah, all the way to being willing to uh, obey the Pope if the Pope tells her to stop doing her work, for example. So it is a commitment to the hierarchy as well as, um, yeah, the theology, the dogma, etc. On the one hand, and on the other, clearly uh, her commitment to what should we call it social justice and being, if not critical of the status quo and the injustices of her day, at least to be doing something about it. And so in her earlier life, that takes her further away from the church because she's frustrated at the, the lack of action as she sees it from the church on those issues. It, she's attracted to um, anarchists and socialists, uh, you know, both writers and kind of people that she meets um, in, 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 in the neighborhoods that she's in, 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 in Chicago, is it New York, etc. You know, she mingles with anarchists and socialists and revolutionaries and she's a journalist. She, she does that kind of journalism. And, and, and when she's over, when she's in that space, she feels a longing. There's something that's missing for her, and 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 it's more of the, yeah, it it it's it's the more religious voice or religious grounding which she doesn't find, and that gets resolved for her, as she says it, mainly when she meets Peter Morin, who then introduces her to the Catholic social teaching, and from then on, she seems more settled in her, should we call it, religious Catholic ontology, but also being an anarchist, at least in her practice. She doesn't use the A word, interestingly, too much. She'll talk about personalism, but she's identified by many uh, as an anarchist, and it's not a word she rejects uh, outright either. She clearly acknowledges her, the anarchist influences upon her. So, and, and then she still kind of, you know, oscillates. We can we can get to the detail of that if you want later. But so I think it's fair to, to, to point to what you're pointing, um, but, instead of perhaps putting them maybe only on a single spectrum from sort of left wing to right wing, I wonder if you've not got two spectrums. Uh, one is if you want, yes, your commitment to, let's call it Catholic theology for uh, simplicity here. Um, and it has struck me over the years that I've met quite a few, encountered quite a few Catholic workers, people who identify as members of the Catholic worker movement or community who aren't Catholic and will tell you that much themselves, as well as some who are almost ambivalent about their religiosity, but they're happy to be part of their local communities because they like the work that it does, etc. That's clearly further away from where Day was and quite a few Catholic workers who are absolutely much more devoted, much more uh, respectful and patient of, of, these, of, of the Catholic tradition, at least embedded in a Catholic social teaching. So you, you clearly have a variety of positions on that. And I think you have a variety of positions on now, is it Tolstoyism or Tolstoyanism? It's a kind of commitment to, if not disrupt, at least speak out against the injustices of, of the day. What makes things more complicated, you see, is that it's not very Tolstoyan to go out and protest. Tolstoy doesn't really advocate that. Tolstoy advocates not doing violence. He doesn't advocate what Hennessy does. And Hennessy is the major Tolstoyan in the Catholic worker movement, but 
Hennessy, um, you know, doesn't decides not to pay taxes, which is already taking things one further than Tolstoy would, although in a way that possibly Tolstoy would approve. But he then, yeah, demonstrates and uh, takes part in all sorts of acts of civil disobedience against the draft, against military conscription. Tolstoy never preached that kind of activism. And yet I suspect that's kind of what you have in mind with what you call the more left wing is a more active sort of civil disobedience. So that's just to note that it's probably more Hennessian than it is Tolstoyan, even if Hennessy is very Tolstoyan, but with a bit more of a militant streak. And yes, you have, I think, as for, but you tell me, you're, you're, you're more embedded in the movement than I am. I'm sitting outside watching with interest, as it were. Um, but you do have a variety of positions from those who would advocate more such, I don't know if militancy is too strong a word, but activism of a civil disobedience kind, and those whose priority might be more living uh, in a community of, of care, and let's could use the Kropotkin expression of mutual aid, maybe uh, in, in, you know, out in the country, on the farms, perhaps in the cities, in the houses of hospitality, but still more focused on doing <laughs> the afflicting, the comfortable kind of work, as opposed to the, com uh, uh, what's the word? No, uh, the comforting, the afflicted kind of work instead of the afflicting, the comfortable, right? So that fa famous, um, uh, Catholic worker motto, conflicting the afflicting, afflicted and inflicting the comfortable. So you have, I think, that variety indeed, but I'm not sure being on one end of one of these spectrums necessarily means you're at the similar end of the other. Uh, so it makes for an even rich, richer variety of views, I suppose. I don't know if I don't know what you think of that, but but so I'm I'm, I'm sort of agreeing, uh, and I think that Day herself embodies this, and you find that with who has influenced her. Uh, but it, it's even more complicated and interesting, perhaps. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I I would think like in, I would say within the discourse, Day is like the fault line and people basically are fighting over that legacy because they want to re read either their more and more and more in perspective or more Catholic perspective um, versus, you know, the Hennessy people want to claim like, Oh, if, if she was around now, she would be I don't know, woke and. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, yes. No, exactly. So I I'm glad, uh, I'm glad this resonates with you. Uh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Cause I hadn't, I mean, I kind of had some sense, like I've, I'm kind of a bird eye of Dave Bote. So I, I'd absorbed his critique that Tolstoy was like too rationalistic and, and moralistic. And, and, and that was the problem. I, I thought it was like a rad lib thing. I hadn't considered that there was a Tolstoyan element to it, but it makes a lot of sense. I think with Tolstoy, if I may add uh, a word or two, um, please. Yes. He's particularly awkward for many Christians, despite him being associated with Christian anarchism, because both of his anti-clericalism, which I've mentioned, and his rationalism, which you've just mentioned. You know, he, he's a Christian only to the extent that he elevates Jesus's teaching. He's not even bothered whether Jesus actually lived when he was asked at, in his lifetime about the scholarship at the time, about the historical Jesus. He kind of responded back, well, if they prove he never existed, so much the better, at least we'll focus on his teaching. That's what he's interested, the ethics, not the metaphysics, as it were. Um, and so, oh, where was I going with this? Uh, yes, that, that, that means that many people who identify as Christians and as anarchists of one shade or another today usually find him too difficult because his Christianity is one they do not recognize as theirs. So for a lot of Christian anarchists, Tolstoy is someone you, even if he's influenced you, you don't necessarily put that to the front because then you have to make explanations for all the bits of Tolstoy that you possibly disagree with. And yet there are some at least anarchists who come to their anarchism through a Tolstoyan position, whether it is with an element of Christianity still surviving, perhaps even a bigger one than, than Tolstoy would have, or purely through a rationalistic kind of position as a rejection of violence, which is also possible with Tolstoy. Um, so yeah, he, 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 he's clearly a, 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 a curious influence on Christian anarchism in reality. He's the main figurehead of Christian anarchism in some of the literature, the academic literature, and yet he's not the main inspiration for most actual Christian anarchists on the ground, it seems to me. Do we know what uh, Morin thought of Tolstoy and, and just the Tolstoyan tendencies in day? Uh, Morin, 
didn't seem to consider pacifism a top priority. Uh, you know, he was more worried about, um, you could call it mutual aid, um, you know, uh, he, publishing his easy essays. Uh, I mean, that, that makes him sound too egocentric, but he was more interested in putting the Catholic social teaching into practice. And in a sense, yes, enacting the Sermon on the Mount, but less the turning of the, the other cheek and more the giving the cloak away and walking the second mile to kind of carry on with uh, with that particular uh, set of verses. That's, from my reading, I'm not, I mean, I have, I've read clearly a fair bit of Morin, but I've read more of Tolstoy. That would be the impression I'm getting. But also, Morin has a stroke in 1944, dies in 1949, and it's really after that that the Catholic worker develops the more civil disobedience tradition uh, uh, influenced by Hennessy, really, and Tolstoyan Hennessy. And so he wasn't there anymore, Morin, to kind of clearly position himself against or for that particular you know, emerging trend. I don't know what he thought of Tolstoy explicitly. I've not I've not come across there might be some writing somewhere left, so some some legacy where we could see exactly what he made of him. What we do in the article is at least try and unpack, you know, the influence Tolstoy had on Day, which for someone who's wrote as much as Day, even then wasn't that easy to unearth because she doesn't say much herself. And clearly he does he does have an influence on on her, and she's well aware. I'm digressing a bit now, but you know, she's well aware of um the bits of him she disagrees with, the anti-clericalism uh, in particular. Uh, I'm not sure she's as fanatical of pacifism as him. She clearly will join Hennessy in acts of civil disobedience at the very least. Okay. I mean, she's clearly a committed pacifist, but but um He's not in. He's not in the streets. He's he's just writing from his estate and welcoming visitors and contributing to debates there. So, um, mm. I don't know what Tolstoy would make of the Catholic worker movement either. I think he would <laughs> probably be quite interested in. He he would probably like a lot the work that it does. The especially well, actually, both the 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 more. Uh, agricultural type of projects and the kind of or, you know, the, the rural type of life because he he idealized the kind of rural lifestyle of the Russian peasants uh, at the time has a kind of romantic view of it perhaps but um, you know uh, certainly dislikes industrialization and, and prefers life away from the cities as it were and he would probably really like the work of the houses of hospitality, uh, you know, sh sheltering uh, uh, immigrants and the oppressed and feeding those who don't have any money. It's a, um, but he probably would have issues with the more militant, the more kind of uh, civil disobedience type acts. Or I don't know if he would actually, but, you know, it's it's difficult to, to make out because he didn't have examples like that to comment on much. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, that's something I wanted to just kind of delve into a bit more, because I was wondering if he would think that some of the dis civil disobedience that some do, whether it's like lying down in front of tanks or destroying like weaponry and things like this, were kind of violent acts. You know, in other words, would they violate in a strict sense his pacifism? These are interesting questions and difficult ones to answer in general, never mind within Tolstoy, as in yeah. what violence is, is rarely discussed or defined in the whole literature on pacifism and nonviolence to begin with. Okay. And, and so, and, and your analysis will, um, yeah, depend on where you put the dial. So my uh, okay, let's go with with this um, this wager. Uh, I think the violence that Tolstoy is particularly worried about is let's call it physical violence against other human beings and actually animals, but against living things. Let's say okay, so hurting animals and human beings. That's what he. That's what his analysis seems to have in mind throughout his writings about violence. So you could make the argument that you can extrapolate that to other forms, other things we call violence today. And you can certainly talk about structural violence because he talks about the violence of the states, but he's what he has in mind is, is the violence 
that polices the boundaries of the state. He's not talking about economic injustice as violence. He's, he's talking about how it is violently protected and sees violence as the problem. So, okay, so if violence is, let's say, only you know, physical violence against other animals and humans, then lying in front of a tank isn't committing violence. Um, in fact, smashing a bank window isn't committing violence by that definition. The police person smashing the skull of the anarchist doing that would be violence. Um, so yeah, let, let's, let's bear that in mind. Now, I think you can again, widen a lot of what Tolstoy says about violence to other forms of violence. Um, but yeah, I think, okay, um, having said all this, what Tolstoy places a lot of hopes on is that, is that, is that in order, is the process whereby people stopping taking part in violence could become contagious and spread and basically let all the structures that depend on violence collapse. So he's hoping that enough conscientious objectors uh, will inspire more conscientious objectors, for example, that it's going to shift public opinion in the way that public opinion shifts you know, very little to begin with and then suddenly things can tip it over and, and you get a kind of new sort of consciousness. I mean, he, that's the kind of vocabulary he'll use it's almost hegelian or he rejects hegel sorry uh destructions uh but so um that's what he places his hopes in and he calls you know he talks about christianity in those terms christianity for him is the consciousness that violence is the problem and that in order not to have that problem anymore people must stop taking part in violence and he's hoping that this will spread by the example of a few hopefully inspiring more and as the concentric circles expand as it were suddenly it tips society into into a kind of new kind of social consciousness as it were now that process he never really as far as i remember he never really considers happening through a more kind of militant form of civil disobedience of the kind of lying in front of a tank sense. He does, uh, uh, ups, but where I think it comes close is he, he, he is well aware that those who choose to refuse military conscrip conscription when it's compulsory, when they'll come and pick you and, and, or, and put you to prison if, if you don't do it, uh, will face consequences, may well be, you know, uh, yeah, imprisoned, possibly executed. His hope is that the example of them being forgiving and loving in their reply in, and, in, and, and, and steadfast in refusing to compromise with violence will inspire others to follow. So you could, I suppose, project a similar logic in a lot of sort of non-violence activism, whereby there is a hope that your example will not only demonstrate your commitment to something and, and highlight that issue, but also because of the political jujitsu that's happening, to use the vocabulary some of these people use, help shift the moral high ground so that even if there is violence in the theater, as it were, it is violence that you are suffering by the other side in it, it repressing you rather than violence you inflict and that and that that might again help awaken the observers and the broader public to what's going on and and shift them shift the moral high ground again so i think i don't think it's a massive jump from the kind of process tolstoy has in mind to kind of lying in front of a tank but once you start considering the full array of potential kind of non-violent acts of civil disobedience, it's going to become quite complicated because quite a few examples take you some way further away from Tolstoy. And so I have in mind, you know, Gene Sharp famously, uh, you know, listed 198 different acts of, what did you call it, non-violent resistance or civil disobedience. There's a lot there. Some of it might be closer to the kind of things Tolstoy had in mind. Some of it might be what he had in mind. Quite a few things there will be a lot further removed. And so, yeah, it's, but then, then it's the classic thing that anyone versed in exegesis understands as the problem of interpretation, something that's been written a while ago and applying it to a context where, which wasn't the one when it was written almost. And how, hopefully this won't take us too far afield, but like in your professional opinion, how do you feel about the efficacy of, of these types of nonviolent action to try and trigger like catalytic social change? 
I'm going to give you the standard answer these days, I think, which is going to point to, uh, where's that book? It's on the shelf somewhere. Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan's book. I don't know if you're familiar with it, uh, Why Civil Resistance Works. It really did shift the ground on the literature. Uh, there you go. It, um, it, um, published in 2011. Because what they do, up, up until their study, really, advocates of nonviolent methods and advocates of, let's call it more militant methods, could trade examples easily. You know, examples where violence in resistance worked, examples where it didn't, examples where nonviolence in, let's call it resistance, work, examples where it didn't. What you didn't have until then is a kind of general statistical analysis that looks that surveys the variety of examples that's what they do um are you familiar with them by the way uh, or um with so what they do is they right they've compiled a database of uh, a period running from 1900 to uh, 2006 or 2008 i can't remember exactly so uh, just over a century of um all sorts of different acts of it, it is resistance. You're, you're looking at people organizing to change something, whether it's to change the regime or to, you know, stop a dam from being built, whatever it is, right? But acts of civil resistance, if you want. Um, they count 323 examples across the world for that whole period. And they code them as violent or nonviolent. And they code them as successful, partially successful or failed, okay? Okay. They then run through the statistics and the results are um, the famous bit. Both violence and nonviolence, just about, fail more often than they succeed. But nonviolence succeeds twice more often than violence does. It is twice more likely to succeed than violent methods. Statistically, if you look at the data, at least coded as they've coded it, there's been some disputing at the margins, but on the whole, it seems to stand. Furthermore, they've also noticed that when it succeeds, nonviolent methods lead to um, socio-political situations, if you will, that are more respectful of human rights and democracy, etc. whereas where violence succeeds in resistance, it gives you much more authoritarian, much more violent types of outcomes, uh, et cetera. So, I mean, it's, it's a classic study these days. It's fairly widely read in some social movements, et cetera, because it illustrates that nonviolence not only can work, but actually seems to work twice more often than violence does. Does it always work? No, nor does violence. But then the question on the side is, what happens to us and to wider society in the process of us trying? And if what we're doing is violent, it tends to lead to kind of polarized, brutalized, violent society, whereas at least doing it this way tends not to, to keep it simple, or much less. Um, so, I, I, you know, that's a long way of saying nonviolence does seem to work better than, 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 than violence does. doesn't work all the time, um, but it seems to... It seems to work. At least it can do. So so just to play devil's advocate, um, you know, I it seems like we're living in a much more violent world than ever before. Right. Like the weapons are bigger, more deadly. The violence in America is out of control. Right. Yeah. I think we can all agree on that. Um, and uh man, you know, like climate change is happening partly due to the giant war machine that we've developed, right, and continues yeah. to operate throughout the world. And so from that larger perspective, is that study really true? In other words, you know, I don't know, I, I haven't looked at it myself, you know, to see why they're how they're measuring success. If we were measuring success in the discrete moment of you know, does this have an impact on this particular policy at this particular point in time? I can imagine maybe that is true. And if we measure success in terms of did the violent operation of the military actually achieve its goals, that's doubly true because most of the time it doesn't achieve its goals. But that doesn't mean that it that it stops being violent. In fact, it just grows and gets bigger and it reacts to every failure by just doubling down. And so from this perspective, I, I mean, being very interested in, I think we're all interested in peace, um, the, the strategy of nonviolent resistance or um, 
especially protest, I would say, the protesting tactics look almost futile. So I wonder like what, what no. response? The, very good question. Um, there is aspects to the answer. I, I'll, I'll go on the gloomy bit first. Will we save ourselves in time? I don't know. Will nonviolence do that? I don't know. Will violence do it though? I'm even less sure. See, if the, the question is what works. I'm not sure what does. We live in a in an era where I don't know how you want to call it. Some people call it capitalism, neoliberal capitalism. It's it's an entire it's it's an it's it's an all englobing economic political system with a kind of supporting culture. Uh, you know, all it's it, 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 it's an ideology, if you want. It, it, it's it's we, we live in an era where uh, we are driving the human race and many of the species on the planet to extinction, where we are threatening our very survival, where we have produced enough weapons to destroy everything several times over. That's just the nukes. Never mind the biological, the chemical, all the small arms, of which there are plenty in the US and elsewhere too. And by the way, to these two threats, because for me, I agree, the, uh, these are two major threats, if you want, the kind of, yeah, let's call it weapons in general, from small all the way to nukes, and 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 kind of ecological meltdown. But I would add the economy, and by which, by, by that I mean both the structural injustice of it all, and the fact that it's unstable. In 2008, we were genuinely close to collapse, and much as I would like things to changed i don't know how to hunt and i'm not sure how i would survive that easily after that those three things are genuinely threatening okay but so many things have been tried in so many ways to resist it um and in a way nothing has worked so one of the critics of nonviolence peter gelelus among in the anarchist movement you know is argues for example that you know gandhi failed because look at where india is today it's just a neo colonial you know space of continued exploitation um you know you, you can you can make arguments like uh, you know nonviolence hasn't worked nonviolence hasn't stopped war uh, you know there's still war there's still violence we're still producing weapons but then the same can be said of violence that it hasn't stopped uh, war either. It, and once again, I think from a kind of pacifist or non-violent kind of perspective, you have to ask yourself what happens to us, that's both the people kind of reacting to this and everyone around them, in the process of trying to change things. And that's where more forceful methods, I think, how do you want to call it? They poison everything. They make things work. They make reconciliation much harder because there's blood on the floor. There's going to be much more grief. And, and it's very hard to see the justice of someone else's cause when they've just killed a relative of yours. Uh, whereas if they have suffered violence, which you are partly responsible for inflicting directly or indirectly, um, it, you approach it differently to begin with. So I suppose, yeah, um, I am not exceedingly confident that peace in the most holistic sense of positive peace, peace that is just and fair, that is ecologically sound, that is economically just as well, and with fewer weapons almost ideally, you know, is that likely personally? But um, and, and therefore I'm all for trying what we can. I'm not saying give up, but this is where the question is of method. How do we do this? Our political systems are deeply problematic in so many ways. Representative democracy is barely democratic, if that. We don't live in democracies. Democracies are still a utopian thing that we don't quite have. I mean, I, I, I could go into that if you want, but we're, we're some way away. Um, so in, in this system, how do we act? How do we react? Well, at the very least, we, we talk about these things, we explore them together, and then we probably need to act as well. And the kind of the full array of nonviolent possibilities gives me much more hope, however little, than imagine what else? What form a guerrilla and 
you know, um, drop bombs, kill who? The system, it's not particular people who are responsible for how we are. It's an entire system. It's a structure. It's a way of, and, you know, you can easily replace, you know, if it's not Boris Johnson, it's someone next. If it's not Trump, frankly, I'm not saying Trump is the same as Biden, but, you know, you'll you'll get alternative. And by the way, all, all through the, uh, since the Second World War, you've had, you know, war, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of gung-ho kind of political administrations in the US, whether Republican or Democrat. Right. You've had so it's not just about it's it's an entire system. It's a, it's a systemic pathology that we are confronting. Uh, it's not people. It's a system. So how do you change that? Probably to some degree by changing mentalities. And let me just add this one thing. The thing about violence is it seems to assume that in order to get something, you exterminate those who are the problem, <laughs> or you force them to comply to something. Whereas with nonviolence, you try and get that change wanted by the others. People come to you, come to the kind of position, or we move together to a common position, because it is willed by all involved. Um, and I can't see how we would, we would get to a kind of better world without it being wanted by a majority of of the people who are taking part in it. It's going to change that kind, it's going to take that kind of change um, than kind of threatening the bad ones with the barrel of a gun to get us there, because that would be unstable anyway. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I, I think we, yeah, I think we'd agree. I would at least agree with everything yes. you just said. Yeah, we, we do agree with and, that. Mm -hmm. And to bring it back, I guess, to the Catholic worker movement, just to use this as an example, uh, just as a group, they more or less agree on general principles perspective. And you still have um, disagreements. And, and I think it's fine to have disagreements because to some extent, it's the friction of having those dialogues that that you figure things out. But to me, what's disheartening, I think, is that it's like, OK, so you have the Catholic worker movement. It, it's relatively small compared to like other powerful forces in society. and um, because you have limited resources, uh, everybody kind of fractures and then let's using the Moran versus Hennessy, uh, like hermeneutic, you have the Moran people like, well, it's truly nonviolent to like have a farm, attend to our Catholic piety, um, and just try and rebuild the, the, the new, build the new world and the shell of the old that way. And it's more futile to try and protest the military industrial complex, which like, you know, on bef during Vietnam, like it, it's a more plausible argument, but like after all these other wars and pr I think the military industrial complex is only worse and more destructive and impersonalized and out of control. And it's like, what are you protesting now? Um, but, but then the, the counter argument is like, well, then you're just apologizing for the status quo. You're not standing up for uh, injustice around the world. And then it's like, people that should be organized and pushing in one direction are instead divided. And then we're just doing our own little idiosyncratic projects. Um, I guess, would you somewhat agree with that view of, of the movement? And do you have any comments on that? Um, I think my, my comment would be that I think this is criticisms. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, it's not, for, I don't know if it's yeah. for me to criticize. Uh, the, I think, no, sure. what I want to say is- I, I meant criticisms of my perspective, if it's wrong. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure. So first off, you actually know the movement better than I do because you're embedded in it. And, uh, I, you know, but what you say, you know, resonates with what I know of it. So yes, that, that seems fair to me. But more to the point, I'd say that this is quite common way beyond the Catholic worker movement across- Anarchists, for example, of which there are loads of different varieties um, across all those, I don't know what you want to call them, progressive forces. Some will prefer kind of the terms of kind of left wing, although some will absolutely not like that because they don't want to describe them as that. But people who are trying to change the world, I mean, that sounds cheesy, whatever. These kinds of debates are absolutely widespread. I don't know who's right. I, it's not for me to arbitrate. Um, I, I suspect most know that most of that work is useful. You kind of need to try and experiment and do things differently and show how things can be done differently, as well as alert people where possible to the fact that things you know, aren't exactly healthy and could be different. Different people have, uh, maybe that's not the right word, but different callings or kind of a, you know, uh, Hennessy left a particular legacy that he did. Morin 
a slightly different one. In a way, the fact that they're, you know, they're where they are leaves a broader legacy for the Catholic worker movement that allows kind of almost anything on, on in that spectrum between the two positions. There may be another figure that's emerging or that will push it in yet another direction. But these kinds of debates about, um, yeah, how to get things changed and whether to even bother and instead just try and live differently and see how we survive for, because it because it's coming and soon enough we'll have to find a way to do that. These kinds of debates exist way beyond just the Catholic worker movement is, is I think, what I'm saying. And so mm -hmm. it's probably a minority everywhere, <laughs> but as... The expression I I, I keep, often come back to it. it it's it, again it's cheesy and simplistic, but you know you'll find it painted on walls now and then in demonstrations. Maybe not any longer. We are everywhere, uh, as in and de you define the we as you wish. But the kinds of people who have the kinds of discussion that we're having, we in that sense might be a minority in the UK, in the city I live in, where you are, or in the US, or in the world. But we are everywhere too. There are examples of people articulating similar diseases, right? Di concerns about the, the current state of things, trying to work for alternatives or push against the status quo in similar ways to what the Catholic worker is doing, but in a different grammar, rooted in a different ontology or different religious worldview or not religious worldview. Um, and I, I don't know if debating it is necessarily wasted effort. I think these are important things to be conscious of as, as difficulties. Because, but just because you do one thing doesn't mean you can't do the other. So sure, time is limited, uh, right? We only have so many hours in the day. But that doesn't mean that just because you mainly live in a commune, you can't also go and take part in a particular demonstration and you can't do different things. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't I don't want to arbitrate between kind of which which position is right or wrong. I'm just I'm just aware that these kinds of debates they happen, and this I guess I'm trying to be um, positive and encouraging in that sense. You know, it's not just the Catholic worker movement on its own that might be having that debate, however small that is. It's many people way beyond it too who have similar discussions and internal too. I'm sure most of, like, I'm sure I'm, I'm going to bet that both of you have had that debate kind of within you, as it were, just as it's head held within a movement. And that's, that's very common. In fact, yeah, I worry more about those who don't even begin to have those conversations, those inner conversations. They have, yeah, those who perhaps are much more uncritically contributing to the perpetuation of everything that makes us ill. Yeah, I think we concluded a while ago that spending too much time in protest is maybe giving the current liberal um, state too much power in a way because you're just reacting. And then for the time that you're reacting in a fairly futile way, as it turns out, you you lose time that you could be spending creating relationships and building networks and mm -hmm. and kind of living in a way that hopefully other people can get some inspiration from. So it's not that we're totally against protests, but it's a matter of what do you want most of your focus to be on and how much do you want to be sort of have your agenda dictated by whatever the, the state and corporate interests do. If that makes sense, it does, and and that's fair enough. But uh, so, but on the one hand, there's also what kind of protest, and all sorts of things that were innovative as ways of protest once upon a time have become more routine, much more recuperated and captured, and can be turned into a a T-shirt that's made in Vietnam by kids and bought by people in the West who think they're cool. So you know all that kind of process happens as well, um, and the other thing I want to say is. Just because you're focusing, you, me, uh, whoever, more on the community work doesn't mean that there might not be a juncture. It might be tomorrow, it might be in a year, it might be in 10, where something happens nationally or internationally that suddenly brings loads of people, including yourselves, out and visibly you know, making a statement. I mean, so many political, radical, big political changes and shifts happen because 
kind of all all of a sudden something suddenly galvanized the public and and all sorts of people came out and basically pushed for a particular change and it, many of these people might be people who are focusing otherwise primarily on on the community etc so yeah um doesn't have to exclude that altogether but i mean yeah i hear you and different communities settle these particular debates differently and that's that's fine too mm-hmm. right and I guess for me, part of what I was I was trying to say and not articulating it well is to me the tragedy of if in fact there's some sort of Hennessy Morin split, it's that Hennessy people need Morin people to succeed so that they have like a social material basis so that, you know, when they're not protesting, they can go back to farms and, you know, recuperate, uh, reinvigorate themselves. Um, versus, you know, you're, you're in a city and you still have to worry about paying rent while you're in jail. Um, and, and vice versa that, you know, you can't just stay on the farm. If you want to actively engage with the rest of society, you have to be sending people out and, and maybe that's a deeper level of, uh, maybe that requires a a kind of sublimated nonviolence in the sense of nonviolence really broadly defined as even like, okay, people in the movement that I partly disagree with, how do we still like actively work together? Instead of I'm in my community, you're in yours, we'll send salvos back. I, I certainly agree that if 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 people settle those debates by basically deciding to take a particular view and not engage with those whose negotiation led them somewhat differently, um, then we're not going to move very far. We're not going to help each other much. I, I think I'd rather approach these different trends as complementary and listen to each other and perhaps shift my own view over time. And look, even Hennessy and Morin, I mean, you know, Morin helped launch a journal, a newspaper that was radical at the time to disseminate ideas that's classed as one of the 198 types of nonviolent actions by Gene Sharp. And, you know, he, he disseminates criticisms of the system in some of his easy essays. Hennessy is often on the streets, but he's also, especially towards the end of his life, really running a Catholic worker community. And he does that at different pi- different times in his lifetime, sets various up. So neither is as extreme as some people might want to make them when they're having those debates today, perhaps, if, if that's the case. So yes, it, I, I'm, I, I'm more for kind of respecting, I suppose, the way people settle these for themselves for the moment. That doesn't mean not engaging and having a good rigorous discussion uh, where the opportunity arises. But at the end of the day, I, I can't judge how you decide to settle it in the work that you prioritize now. I I, I think that, well, I, I do. You know, one of the reasons I like that saying is I think it does capture two flanks of something that uh, the, the two flags, both of which are important, you know, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, um, seems to be, uh, you know, uh, it, it seems to be important to do a bit of both uh, in the long run. It does a movement. I don't know. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, before we got out of here, we did want to talk about Kropotkin as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. Could you tell our listeners a bit about him and his Russian anarchist influence yeah, at, I, next to Tolstoy. And I particularly wanted to know, um, you know, why Morin brought Kropotkin to um, day. In reading your article, it almost sounded like Kropotkin was kind of like an antidote to Tolstoy, but that didn't totally make sense to me. So I wanted to get more of an explanation. <laughs> it, and yeah, uh, so I, you know, my colleagues, uh, Matt Adams and especially Ruth Kinner, are the Kropotkin ex- experts. Um, you know, I, I've read some, of course, but I, 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 you know, I don't know him as well as I know Tolstoy. Why did Morin prefer Kropotkin? First of all, he, you know, he, he's not as complicated to. To, 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 to name as an influence. Again, I think Tolstoy, the moment you name him as an influence, you kind of have to make excuses for various kind of positions he has. And, and if, you know, if you're like Kropotkin, whereby you're probably against violence most of the time, but uh, there are moments when you might consider it because he's a bit ambivalent. And that seems to be more or less where Morin was, uh, kind of accepting at least the theoretical just war position of the Catholic Church, even if few wars are actually meeting all those conditions in reality, he wouldn't 
reject violence in principle. Well, with Kropotkin, you could do that. And Kropotkin is much more widely read in the anarchist movement and in the socialist movement more broadly, as it were. Um, you know, he's a respected geographer. He's someone who responds to the social Darwinists of the time in a way that's helpful and articulates that quite well with mutual aid, etc. Um, he's also much more embedded in the movement. Again, Tolstoy spends most of his time writing from his estate. Kropotkin is in, in, in Russia, in England, but involved contributing to the newspapers read by the, 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 the trades union syndicalists, etc. at the time. He's much more embedded with the activists, the labor movements of the time as well. Um, I don't know why Morin insists on Kropotkin. Potkin, strictly speaking, I, I just think it resonates better with him. And I suppose the kind of advocating of mutual aid, to use Kropotkin's language, that Kropotkin advocates, is quite close to the kind of vision of the Catholic social teaching based on the Sermon on the Mount that Morin wants to see within the Christian community. So they resonate quite well. And I guess that's why he he encourages Day to read more Kropotkin when, when, when they meet. And for a while, well, no, she certainly acknowledges Kropotkin as an influence, at least as often as Tolstoy, um, if if not more. Uh, whereas Tolstoy, as, I, as we say in the article, she kind of keep quiet as an influence for the reasons I've already mentioned. Um, you know, she had issues with some of it and she didn't necessarily want to have to go into debates about that. Um, does that answer your question? I'm sure I forgot a couple of angles I wanted to cover, but... Uh, yeah, I I think so. I was kind of curious whether we had the manuscript that Morin um, made for Dorothy Day digesting Kropotkin. Is that does that exist? I don't know. Is the honest answer that would be interesting. I I don't know, and maybe it's in the archives. Uh, I I I don't know, honestly. <laughs> well, that would be very interesting to see, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, yes. I guess Kropotkin also outlives Tolstoy, right? So he dies, what is it, in 1920 or 21, after the Russian Revolution, kind of goes back and experiences some of it, contributes to the debates about where it's going and what to do about it. Tolstoy dies before it. Um, and in that sense, is you know, yeah, uh, has less to say about, yeah, even kind of revolutionary Russia. I don't know, uh, yeah. Um, gotcha. Kropotkin is more widely read among anarchists as well, anyway, than Tolstoy today. Uh, whether, but I don't think that's why Morin would have preferred Kropotkin because he comes more as a, a personalist, a Catholic, uh, th than as an anarchist. I think primarily, anyway. So yeah, that's, I'm just, yeah, yeah. yeah probably by yeah. now. And and is another aspect of it that he had more like material engagement in the sense that he's like, here's how you could organize society along different lines versus yes. like, let's just be nonviolent and everybody will become nonviolent. Sorry, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. He has. Yeah. And he wrestles with exactly those kinds of you know, the difficulties, you know, what you actually do concretely. Tolstoy only really says just stop doing violence. And that's a bit a bit binary and simplistic. Yeah. There's much more to it. So absolutely. I think that, I think that's right. Um, yes. And and he ha also has more to say about industrial society in the way that's not as overtly and completely dismissive as Tolstoy. Um, and, and I, you know, as something that's problematic, but I mean, Tolstoy basically just wants a complete return to, am I simplifying? He, he eulogizes the, the life of Russian peasant communities so much that he seems to basically just want to kind of return to that. Um, he doesn't like the cities. He doesn't like everything that that represents. You know, trains he dislikes as the emblem of it. If you've read any Tolstoy, you know when there's a train, something bad's about to happen. Always. Um, whereas... Kropotkin's got more time for, you know, cities and how they, you know, and that he's very critical of a lot of aspects of it and the hierarchies that have come to dominate them, etc. But he's going to work with it more than Tolstoy will. Sounds like Kropotkin's just, it is also just more, um, you can mash him up with Catholic social teaching, even though, yes. you know, not 100%, but probably more than Tolstoy. <laughs> Yes, including, but now I don't know how much he's written on the church himself. I, I'm, I'm going to suspect he wasn't particularly keen on orthodoxy, but he doesn't rant in the way Tolstoy does against the Catholic church so much that it makes him an awkward one to mention if you're a Christian, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I suspect that's also true. Yeah. Yeah. 
Here's since since you've read so much about all this stuff, I guess I'd be curious if like the the three biggest thinkers in, in the worker movement have been Day, Morin, and Hennessy. Um, and since you you ha- you clearly have like a certain affinity t- for it, but you're you know you're not a Catholic worker. If there was like a fourth grade figure that did pull you into the Catholic worker, like what would draw you? to that, to, to this person and, and to the movement that, that would win you over. Win me over. Yeah. Turn you, if there was a fourth grade, the greatest Catholic thinker, Catholic worker thinker ever that pulls you into the movement, like what could that maybe look like to draw you in? If it's even possible. I like, don't know. Feel free I, to don't know. I, I, I don't know because it would make it a different thing to what it is, right? The Catholic worker movement is in many ways what it is at least in part because of these three great influences, if not thinkers. I mean, there are others, but they clearly shaped uh, the contours of what it did. Definitely. Yeah. I'm going to say that Tolstoy clearly influenced at least two of them, um, certainly Hennessy, and at, at the very least indirectly, but significantly Day. Um, I don't know if that brings me to the Catholic worker movement. I, I think the main thing that will make it... Well, the main thing... Yeah. I don't know how much of a Christian I am to begin with, and I think that makes it difficult to 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 make the jump. If if I mean that's not the word you use, but I think the moment you are rooted in a, a more Christian worldview, then I'd probably be uh, much closer to the Catholic worker movement, as in all the other bits. If you want the more the, the social, the social, the political, the economic. I mean, all these dimensions are very much you know, resonating with me, if you want. Um, I Yeah. So I don't know. And in that sense, Tolstoy is already um, the, the person who might draw me in that direction. But uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think it ultimately matters as long as as many of us as possible are working towards basically similar goals um, in, 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 you know, in our differences within the Catholic worker movement, within other movements, between them, et cetera, which I think many people are. Um, and, and, and that's, I suppose, what gives me hope to the extent that there is any left. <laughs> gotcha. Is that a fair answer? Sorry. But, but yeah. 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 And I think that's, that's a very, nice way to end actually i thought that last line was was good that's definitely our vibe as well <laughs> we're we're trying to hold on to hope we understand completely what the odds are you know so uh, what else are you going to do right like that's that's it um, i agree i uh, you know i um i was listening to this uh this talk recently that that I'm going to convert to my to the local school where my kids are uh, as follows, which is when they're 25. So in about 20 years time, we're probably going to be hitting two degrees, right? So beyond the Paris Agreement. This is we've always hit the worst case scenarios, and you look at things like the oceans have gone up by 0.2 degrees in in a year. I mean, you know, by the time they're 50, my kids, they're, they're five and seven, eight, eight. Um, by the time they're 50, we'll probably be on three degrees. This is soon. Um, things are going to accelerate. But I want to find the hope in the fact that so many people are worried about this, are trying to do what they can, and are trying to find the tools despite everything, despite having no time because they're so busy with work and whatever else. And um, But yeah, what, what, what will... Follow, I don't know, uh, I, but yeah, you have to, you have to see though, not just the kind of Hobbesian and the dark in the human condition and the ability to keep reproducing things that make us suffer. You've got to try and see the positive as well. The fact that so many people are moved to be more critical and to try things differently everywhere too. Exactly where it will settle us, I don't know, but um, time will tell and we might see it sooner than we think. <laughs>